So we're going to go briefly through event sourcing today. And then we're going to start looking at a bunch of different problems. And inside of these problems, we're going to start seeing massive amounts of accidental complexity come out because we're using the wrong models. And then we're going to come back through and we're going to focus on how do we use the right models. Now, I'm sure you all know, um, I don't actually live in America anymore, but I am American. And Americans are known worldwide for their, their subtleness and reserve. Please do not feel bad about asking me a question when I'm talking. Um, I, it will not bother me that much. Now, before we get into polyglot data, I want to go through a very brief overview of what event sourcing is, just for the people that may not know what event sourcing is. This talk is not about event sourcing, but we all need to at least have some level of shared understanding. Now, what's interesting for me is in going around and looking at business problems, almost no business problems that are in mature industries have the concept of current state inside of them. Think about finance. Think about accounting. Think about insurance. They don't have the concept of current state. Current state is a transient concept. What they do is they store facts that occur at points in time. How many of you have a bank account? <laughs> Do you think your balance is a column in a table? What would happen if it were? So now you disagree with your bank about how much money is in your account, and they said, the almighty table says this amount, therefore it's correct. And you go, I need a new bank. No, your balance is an equation. Your balance is a summation of all the transactions that have occurred inside of your account. I may store it in a table, but that's a cache, nothing more. It's not authoritative. The same thing holds true with any business problem that we want to look at. Most people today, they work with structural models, and this has been my quintessential example of a structural model where we have a purchase order with N line items and shipping information. And this could be a document. This could be stored off in a SQL database. This could be an XML file. How many of you have worked with a structural model like this before? This is not the only way of representing this information. I can also represent this information as a series of events. So we have cart created, three items added, and shipping information added. Now, those three items added, those are actually three events. But if I made all three events on this slide, the boxes got really little and you couldn't read them anymore. I can, at any point in time, take these five events and I can replay them and I can give you this piece of structure. I can always replay this set of events and give you back the structure of what it actually represents. But I don't store the structure. I store the series of events. And there's a lot of benefits to storing facts as opposed to storing your perception of facts. This is a perception of the given facts. The main difference that you start finding is that over time your perception changes. Now the real reason why almost all the mature industries are using this as opposed to this is because this does not lose information. This, I don't care what model you pick, you are losing information. As a CTO, I had only one rule for my firm. We would not lose any data. The reason we would not lose any data is because I had no freaking clue how to value it. How do you do cost-benefit analysis if you don't know how to value the future? We were storing over 100 gigabytes a day of data like this, and this was years ago. This model is guaranteed to lose information. How many of you have an update or delete statement in your system? How many of you had a, a C-level meeting to talk about the value of that data in the future? So you just decided that this data is worthless and we will just get rid of it. And a lot of problems come from this. Now, this slide, it took me forever to find. And the reason why is because accountants don't do that. The same thing happens, well, maybe at Enron. 
But accountants don't race in the middle of their ledger. When we talk about these event-sourced systems, event-sourced systems are append only. There is no concept of delete and there is no concept of update. This has a nice side effect. If I were to go through and set an HTTP cache on an event, what would I set it for? Infinite. All of our data is completely immutable, and we are an append-only model. Now, what this can lead to is we might, for instance, say that now we've got cart created, three items added, one item removed, and then shipping information added. Cool. Is this the same as cart created, two items added, shipping information added? And I see some people saying yes and some people saying no, and that, that's great because this is always a confusing question for people. The answer is it depends on your perspective. If I were using this model and I'm projecting this model off the two event streams, they're going to come up and be the exact same. What if I were doing a different model, though? What if I were making a model that would tell me which items were removed from a cart? Would they end up the same? And this is a nice trick that you can play inside of your systems today. If you can find any two sets of use cases that leave your structural model at the same endpoint, guess what? You just proved you're losing data. What's the value of the data that you just lost? Depending on my perspective, these will end up with different results. Now, this is best seen with a use case, and I've been using this use case for years. Let's go back to this model, and let's imagine we're Amazon.com. And they say, you know what? I think people that remove their items from their carts within six minutes before they check out, I think they're more likely to buy that item in the future than the other items that we show them based on their preferences. Why? When do you remove an item from your cart six minutes before you check out? You looked at your cart and it was going to be like $370 and you're like, my wife's going to kill me. I can't do this. I need to take two or three items out of the cart. It's not that I don't want them. I'm just prioritizing them lower than the other items that were inside of my cart. So what do we do here? We add a new thing called removed line items. And then we write a report that looks for removed line items and then does a nested subquery to see if you bought that item in the future. Roll it out to production. User runs his report. What does he see? Nothing. That report will work from this moment in time forward. Let's do it in this model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a projection now. And we're going to talk a lot about projections today. Projections could be in memory. Projections could go to a SQL database. Projections could go to Neo4j. Projections could go to uh, MongoDB. Not that I highly recommend that. And what the projection is going to do is it looks for the item removed. And it says, I am now searching for this item in the future. Then it sees the shipping information, which is the equivalent of the checkout. And it says, was this within six minutes of that? It was. Mark, searching for this item in the future, found equals false. And then as I go forward in the future, if I find that item in someone's cart, I mark true for found. Now, what I haven't told you about projections is when you run a projection, it always has to start on event zero and come forward. So it will go to the very first event this system has ever done and come forward all the way till right now, and then it will run into the future. I then write a report based on that output state. What does my business user see when he runs that report? He sees the report as if it's always been in the system. In fact, he can even go back and he can look at what that report would have told him if he had that report on July 14th at 2.13 and 22 seconds in the afternoon. This is where the real value of event sourcing is coming from. It's this ability to look at things with new perspectives and to go back in time and look at history with perspectives that you have today. In a real world example, imagine being able to take your brain as it exists today and send it back in time to when you were 12 years old at your first dance. And you could perceive the facts then as you understand them today. It's actually a really scary scenario. I wouldn't recommend doing it. And there's all sorts of cool things that we can do because we can move forwards and backwards through time. We can fire up new ways of looking at our problem, and it all comes back to that we're not losing any information. 
And the only thing that you can do to not lose any information is to store a series of events. There's no other model that will do it. Any other model you pick will lose some information. It's just a matter of what information are you losing. Now, how many of you have heard of some of these before? All of these are wonderful databases. They're all the hot new things. If you're not cool, if you're not using these, except for one of them. <laughs> how many of you have heard that SQL is dead? No one will ever use SQL ever again. New SQL, no SQL, that's the way to go. Yeah, sure. There is no best storage. Every database on the planet sucks. Every single one of them. Whether we're talking about Neo4j, because there's a couple guys in here. Um, whether we're talking about Cassandra. Whether we're talking about Oracle. Whether we're talking about Event Store. They all suck. Every single one of them. And they all suck in their own unique ways. How many of you remember these? Does this remind people of the NoSQL movement today? Years ago, they said that no one will ever use SQL again because we have these new things called object databases. And object databases are the best thing ever. Object databases, they rock. We can use Java with Spring XML configuration and store our data in XML. And if you didn't know, Java is a language to convert XML to stack traces. <laughs> if we can store our data in XML, we'll make it even better. But everyone found out that these things actually suck. When I used an object database behind my domain model, how many of you have used Hibernate before? Hibernate's really nasty because you get this giant impedance mismatch between you and your database. These don't have that impedance mismatch. When I go to get an object, I walk from one object to another object. That, that operation is done big O of one inside of that object database. So why did everybody stop using them? How many of you use an object database today? Occasionally, I'll get one hand. Actually, and they're, they're normally working in financial systems. A lot of the old backing financial systems are still in object databases. Why did they suck? Why didn't they take over the world? What happened was people would go through and they'd build their domain model up on top of their object database, and everything would be hunky-dory. And they'd be just getting ready to go to production. And then that stupid business person would come over and say something like, you know, I need a report. And what I want is a report that takes all the sales from the customers. I want to roll them up by customer. And then I want to get an average and standard deviation for their, their ticket size. And I want to get a summation total of how much they've been spending. And you're like, that sounds like a group buy. Or you could try doing it in an object database. And it's going to be horrifically painful to do. You need to load up 800 million objects into memory and go through and basically deal with this. And so everyone said, you know, object databases suck. We should never use them. Perfectly rational thing. They, they suck at doing OLAP behaviors. So we just won't use them anymore. When we start getting into these kinds of systems, it's extraordinarily rare that a single data model will actually work to do everything that you want to do and do it well. And we can go through lots of examples of where people pick the wrong models and it causes lots of problems. How many have heard of this small startup? So when they started going, you remember the fail whale? What Twitter is at its core is a topic-based pub sub. Of course, there, there's no prior art inside of this problem. And they ended up implementing it in Ruby on Rails on top of MySQL until they had hundreds and hundreds of MySQL instances. You may know that they've, they've since changed all of that. But they ran into the problems because the model that they were trying to use underneath things wasn't appropriate to what they were trying to do. Another example. We have a table. It's got an ID, a parent ID, and then some data. How many of you have implemented this before? Come on, you can admit it. This is for a menu bar. And then you push this off to production. And production comes back to you and says, why is this report taking nine minutes to run? And of course you say, well, it works fine on my machine. What's wrong with your production environment? 
Well, what's wrong with their production environment is that instead of having the 20 rows of data that you had, they've got 170,000 rows of data. And what you've created here is known as a recursive query. Now, you guys are all smart developers, so I imagine what you did next was this. <laughs> Where now I'm going to have ID, parent ID 0, parent ID 1, parent ID 2, parent ID 3, and you do the parent IDs all the way out to the depth that you want to be able to query. Because that way I can just do a query and I could say where parent ID equals or parent ID zero equals or parent ID one equals or parent, and then I can rearrange them in memory and do the recursion in memory. This is very similar to another problem I've seen. I have seen this particular problem at least three or four times over the last six months with real clients, many of them in America. So what they have here is they've got a table for person. And a person has a name or a type, and I don't know why it's named person and there's a type company. It doesn't make any sense. And then they have a relationship table where they have a relationship ID, a person ID, a person ID, because I'm mapping two people together. And then they have a relationship type. How many of you have implemented something similar to this? Now, the business problem that they're solving is they, they start saying, you know, I've got Joe here. And I want to see if this person is related to Joe up to three levels based on these relationship types. Like they can be a caregiver or a parent, but they can't be an uncle. So show me whether or not this is true and what's the quickest path to get between them. They had a roughly 10 engineers working on this problem for about a year. We actually fixed this for them uh, in, in about three days. What we did was we brought in this database called Neo4j. It's a graph database. This is a graph problem that they implemented inside of SQL. And it requires recursive queries. They were running nearly a half million dollar SQL server to support these queries. We were outperforming them on a laptop. This is common. And I've seen this problem happen over and over and over again. Now, I'm not going to say that you guys are incapable of writing a graph database, but how many of you have a PhD in graph theory? No one? OK, I trust the people at Neo4j more. And it was actually funny. I was doing this talk in Budapest about two weeks ago, and I asked that question. There's actually a guy in the audience. He's like, well, actually, I do have a PhD in graph theory. <laughs> and it's like, well, shit. What we're seeing here is that the wrong model causes massive amounts of accidental complexity. We're not talking like adding 20 minutes or 30 minutes to your day because of the wrong model. We're talking about taking things from a year of 10 people working to three days of two people working. All the rest is massive accidental complexity. Other examples of this can be seen. How many of you have seen SQL Server full text indexing? What do you think does better job, that or Lucene? Lu Lucene blows it out of the water. But we always try to find one solution to our problems. And what we really want to be doing is we want to actually be separating and using multiple models inside of our problems. Now, I've been talking about one form of this separation for a very, very long time. Um, and that is CQRS, uh, Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. Because reads and writes are different, we should separate based on reads and writes. This is not the first time I talked about event sourcing. This is actually the second, I believe. And it was hilarious because I wasn't really talking that much. And I know mentioned I was very young back then. I, I mean, we're talking what? It's like seven years ago. So I'm like 27 years old. Hadn't talked much at conferences. I come out. I probably had 20 cups of coffee. My front row, people I've never met, Martin Fowler, Gregor Hope, and Eric Evans. And I'm going to be talking about extending their work. I think I went through my entire talk in like 22 minutes. <laughs> and afterwards, Eric comes up to me and he's like, you know, that was a bad talk. <laughs> and it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. But reads and writes are one way that we can start distinguishing and separating. Now, for me, the reads are the interesting part of systems. Writes are really simple, and we'll talk more about them. 
But if you look at most systems, the interesting ways that you're going to be putting your data is about how you want to read your data, not about how you want to write your data. And when we look at the reads, it's usually reads that need to scale, not writes. I bet most of you could run the writes of your system on my mobile phone. How many of you do more than 50 transactions per second? Couple hands. I know there's a lot of finance guys here, so I, I should be fair and say that in financial systems, this is completely backwards and you get lots and lots of writes for very few reads. But most systems, the reads are what I need to scale. And I, I get brought in for a lot of scalability problems. And one thing I always find funny is you go and look at their, their problems and their problems are scaling their reads off of their SQL database. I bet most of you are somewhere between one and two orders of magnitude more reads than writes. My guess is most of you are somewhere between 90 to 99% reads. Now, how many of you have a third normal form database or right around third normal form? This is what I typically find. You built a model that was optimized for writing and then wonder why you have problems scaling your reads. It's the same thing we were talking about before. But reads are almost always the interesting side of things. Writes are almost never interesting. If I go look inside of Neo4j, if I go look inside of Event Store, if I go look inside of SQLite, if I go look inside of Cassandra, you know what? They all work the same way for writing. So does Oracle. So does SQL Server. They append to a log. And then internally, after they append to a log, they will go and update whatever the thing they're going to be querying it is, whether it's a B tree, is it a stored string table. They all work almost identically. Now, in general, storing events is a good lossless transactional model. That's what the database does internally. You can do the same inside of your code. Why not, for writes, just store an event? That's what we were talking about all the way back when we were talking about event sourcing. I'm just appending events to a log. Now, reads and writes are one form of separation that we can talk about, but there's other forms of separation that exist. Another very common form of separation is time. Time will allow us to separate out different models. Now, if I go into finance, this is actually a domain concept. It's the concept of intraday data versus interday data. Today is treated differently than any other day in the history of mankind. And this is common to see. What I've been seeing a lot lately is big multivariate problems, things that people are doing large map reduces across. And what I'm finding is they will end up having this massive map reduce job, let's say using 80 Amazon extra large nodes, and then they do that once per month. And that will give them perfect answers to their multivariate problem. But now the business wants to get that every day. How much does it cost to ramp up 80 Amazon extra large nodes for a month? It's prohibitive. But what we can do here is we can separate based on time. And what you'll normally end up with is you'll end up with a large Hadoop, let's say, batch job. And then we'll put in a little tiny speed complex event processor. Now, what the complex event processor is doing is it's going through knowing what this thing said and what you cared the most about, because let's say you're bidding on things because of that information. And as it's going through, it's invalidating thin slices of the big problem and then doing little tiny MapReduce jobs to try to, in, to update just a very thin slice of the overall MapReduce job. This is very, very common, and it can get you to the goal of having near real-time information without taking the expense of having 80 Amazon Extra Large nodes running constantly. This is a really common form of separation of models between data that's over one day old versus data that's current. You will see these separations start happening all of the time, and almost never do you want to have a single model. Single models will cause problems. You're always going to end up, because every database sucks in its own unique ways. 
Now, when we start looking at how to do this, a lot of problems come up. How many of you have tried running with two databases in your organization before? Did they go out of sync? What happens when I run three models and they all tell you three different things? It causes a big problem. And this is typically what ends up happening. So this is my stereotypical way that I see people trying to implement multiple models in their system. So basically they've got a client that's talking back to a domain. The domain might be backed by something like Hibernate talking to a third normal form database. The domain model will then publish events off to this magical thing called a bus. And the bus will then deliver the events off to the things that are going to be reactive. So we may write into an OLAP database, we may write into a graph database, we may look at things from a stream processing perspective. This is doomed to failure. By the way, has anybody here ever watched Martin Fowler's talk, Does My Bus Look Big in This? I would highly recommend it. But in production, this will not actually work well. One of our first problems has to do with this. So if my domain model is going to write into a third normal form database, and it's going to publish a message into a bus, what does it need? Well, what happens if I go to write to the database, and I get a success, and then I say, now publish to the queue, but someone unplugs me right before I say that? So now we're going to need a distributed transaction of some type. Stay away from distributed transactions. Avoid them like the plague if you can. But there's a more sinister problem here. I know none of you would put a bug into software, but you have juniors on your team. What happens if we have a bug here? Let's say that there's a bug, and into the domain model, we set the state to be a hard-coded Connecticut. Well, we take whatever our client's command was and correctly put that onto the event to go off to everybody else. So now this database says it's in Louisiana and that database says it's in Connecticut. How do you handle this? This is a very, very big problem. Now, let's just say that that occurred. How would I detect that that occurred? How do you reconcile between a SQL database and a graph database? This should be fun, right? Well, just write a reconciliation script. Of course, which is more likely to have happen? That you actually found a bug or that you've got a false positive because your migration script is broken? Or sorry, your reconciliation script is broken. Okay, let's imagine that we found out that this occurred. How do we fix it? Do we go back from the OLAP model to the third normal form model and open up a distributed transaction through linked servers or something? We've got a really big problem here. But there's a more sinister problem. And that's what happens when I try to bring out a new model. And we talked about one of the beautiful things about event sourcing and this keeping of streams of events is that I can have new perceptions that I come up with at any point in time. And I have a new one now. And I want to start saying, okay, I need to get back all of my events so I can bring up my new model. How do I do that with this bus in the middle? Do I do that? What's happening here is I've got a bunch of queues. I would have to send a message from the new model back over to something on the other side to say, hey, I need you to resend me all the events I haven't seen before. In other words, I need a control channel, very much like an FTP. Can you imagine if blogs worked like this? So you, you've come to my blog and you want to subscribe. So I say, okay, cool. Um, if you want to subscribe to my blog, send me an email. I will create a queue for you and then send you a link to your queue. And then you say, but I don't just want the, the, um, the blog post in the future. I want to get your historical blog post too. So you send me another email that says, I want your historical <laughs> blog posts. And then I, I pump the historical blog posts into your queue. This doesn't sound very scalable. This is actually a huge problem, and it's a source of accidental complexity that people don't see when they start building this, and they find out at the end, once they've gone to production. 
And the thing is, it's really hard to undo this once you've done it. This is a fairly typical problem. But there's other ways of dealing with this particular situation. And in order to think about them, we need to think about how blogs actually work. And if I have a queue here, what we have is known as a, uh, a producer-driven subscription. The producer remembers the state of the subscription. If you are following my blog, it doesn't make sense for me to know the state of your subscription. You keep the state of your subscription. You remember how far along you've actually come, and when you come back up, you ask me for anything after that point in time. And that allows for a lot of interesting things to happen here. So now instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have a client that's talking to a domain. And behind that, we're just going to store all of our events. And we're going to expose them over a protocol, let's say, Adam. Adam would be perfect for this. Now, all of these subscribers remember their own state. They don't have queues. They all just, let's say, listen to an RSS feed of the events that are happening. Now, if this guy needs to reset and go from event zero, what it's going to do is it's just going to forget its own subscription information and go all the way back to the beginning and say, oh, I, w I was at 122, but forget that. Give me the next 20 events after negative one. Each of these controls their own subscription. On the other side, we no longer have two sources of truth. We don't have the events and the third normal form database. We only have the events. By the way, if I'm writing to an event store and I'm writing to an event store, do I need a distributed transaction? No, because you're only writing to one store at this point. It's a single local transaction. There's no need for distributed transaction. Writing to that event store is the equivalent of doing a publish. It's this, it, the same operation. It's save and publish as part of the same operation. And these are all just following, checkpointing, off of what is available over in those events. But where the real beauty of this model starts to come into play is when we start saying that we're going to add a new model to this. Before, when we were back here, a new model is going to need to talk to something on the other th side through a control channel to say, I want you to come up and start sending me over events. By the way, this is always an interesting question. So if I talk over the control channel to you to tell me to resend my entire history, and there's currently things that are happening right now, do you interleave them into my history? Do you cache them until you're done sending me the history? How do we coordinate when I get those new events compared to when the old events were being sent across? And it's actually a really, really hard problem, and it requires generally that you're going to go off and build some infrastructure. Here, this model controls its own subscription. It controls its own state of its subscription. It can just throw away that state, start from event zero, and come forward again. The easiest way to think about these protocols is imagine that every event is given a number. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. When I first come up, I say, give me the next three events after event negative one. So I get zero, one, two. Once I've processed two, I remember I have saved two, and I say, give me the next three events after two. By the way, I crash right now. So I come back up, I say, what's the last thing I have processed? Event number two. Give me the next three events after event number two. And what this does is it simulates um, at least once messaging. Now, you can actually simulate transactional messaging with this as well if you store atomically your checkpoint with the work that you're actually doing. And it's a really nice, cheap way to be able to simulate doing this kind of workflow. Here, this is just going to blow away whatever its state was. If, if I want to replay this, something, I just say, forget everything that you've seen before and start back at negative one and come forward. There's no coordination that needs to happen between these two. It's all going to happen on this side. And this will help to remove a lot of accidental complexity inside of these kinds of systems. Another benefit that we can have here, could I have two OLAP models that are identical? If we started seeing we're getting too much load on our OLAP model, 
people running reports. Could I just spawn off a second one right next to it and then put a load balancer in front of these two as to which one gets the query? Providing that my OLAP model fits into one silo, yes. And this is very often how we scale in these kinds of systems. Now, and where's my slide? There it is. And this is supposed to be an animated GIF, but I switched it to PDF, and apparently PDF doesn't like animated GIFs very much. What this is, is this is a Rude Goldberg machine. And it, as an animated GIF, it's so much better because it's actually going all over the place. And I don't want people to walk out of here saying, Greg told me that we should use 10 different databases. We should use a different database for every problem that we have. We saw that Lucene is the absolute best at doing, uh, at doing full text indexing. And you know, we've got a full text indexing problem that we do over here where pe people start typing in this one thing and we do autocomplete on it. So we need to get Lucene. And we realized that we've actually got a graph in our system. It's the 28 items that make up our, our menu. So we need to bring in Neo4j in order to handle our menu. This is not what I'm saying. When we talk about this kind of stuff, you need to remember there's two sides of this. The other side of this is accidental complexity, um, and uh, sorry, operational complexity. If I, for instance, bring in MongoDB, somebody in operations needs to know what the hell MongoDB is. They need to know how to configure MongoDB. They need to know how to monitor MongoDB. How do you do a backup for MongoDB? Somebody is going to need to know all of this information in order to be able to get the stuff working. And that has a cost as well in terms of complexity from operations perspective. I am not saying that you should go off and get a customized database for every single thing that you want to do. Instead, I'm saying more understand the trade-offs. You will take accidental complexity because you're choosing the wrong model. If I choose lots of models, I introduce operational complexity. The answer sits somewhere in the middle. Now, if I were to come to your company and you were to show me that you've got a small full text indexing problem and you said, you know, we do it inside of SQL Server, I would say, oh, okay. And then if you said, you know, and we do it inside of SQL Server because we were looking at bringing Lucene in and the cost of bringing in Lucene from an operations perspective was much higher and we, we don't really have much data. We've only got 100,000 rows of data. We're doing it over anyway. So based on the trade-off, we decided that we would actually use SQL Server indexing. I would have absolutely no problem with that. That is an informed, conscious decision. If you're bringing me in for a performance problem with full text, uh, full text searching inside of SQL Server, and I were to say, well, have you considered using something like Lucene or Elasticsearch, you went, Lou what? That would be a bit more of a problem. If we're going back and we're looking at a system that is built like this, and when I mention a graph database, you go, oh, what? This is, we really need to be getting in and understanding all of the different kinds of databases. They're all valuable, and they all suck. If you use them in the right places, everything will work well. If you use them in the wrong places, it will really suck. Operational complexity needs to be taken into consideration when looking at this. We do not just say that we're going to put in a custom database for every single thing that you want to do. But understand that you can put in a custom database for everything that you want to do. I normally in systems will see at least three models. I'll normally see some kind of key value store, or document store that represents data that's just being shown back up on screens. I want quick query access to this to be able to show it very quickly up to a user on a screen. There's normally going to be some type of searching inside of these systems. And almost always there's going to end up being some OLAP system that people use for reporting. Almost every system I see will end up with about these three. Graphs are another really common one that we'll see start coming into the problem. Event processing is another common one we'll start seeing in the problem. But keep in mind that there is the downfall of this, which is operational complexity. I am not telling everybody to go off and grab 10 databases and put them in production. Understand there are costs. Although to be fair, the cost of running 10 other databases will be probably cheaper than one Oracle license. Now, some takeaways. Just appending to a journal 
is a really, really good model to sit behind the writes inside of your system. This is what your database most likely does internally anyway. It's just writing to a transaction log, and then it's internally going off this and updating its internal structures. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you just saying, you know what, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to give the chance for other databases to read off of the same journal that I'm writing to. Absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And by the way, you can get this to be really, really, really fast. Handling tens of thousands of transactions per second is absolutely no problem doing that. It's relatively simple to reach. And I'm not talking on like Fusion I.O. Uh, boards or something like that. On a Fusion I.O. board, I've actually seen them get up over a half million. This transaction log can be events. And this kind of brings us back to the idea of event sourcing. The general idea is my book of record is this log of events that I'm writing. My operation of a write is just to append an event to a log, and then I'm considered done. This append only immutable data works really, really well for a lot of systems. How many of you have needed to communicate something to your UI before as well? Could my UI also listen to one of these Atom feeds that we were representing events over them and put updates saying, by the way, this person's also looking at this data or updated it? Be relatively easy to do. And having that event model makes it relatively simple. CQRS is one way of finding different models. So saying, I'm going to have my writes on this side and my reads on the other side. But it's not the only form of being able to segregate out models. And if there's one single thing I want everybody to walk away with, it's that every database in the, in the world, it sucks. Every single one of them. It doesn't matter what the model of it is. There are problems that it will suck at. Neo4j, I love Neo4j. Try doing a set operation in Neo4j, and you'll realize that it sucks. I love SQL. Try building a graph in SQL, and you'll realize that SQL sucks. I love event store. Try doing a query like, I'd like to see all the customers whose first name starts with the letter G. And you realize that it sucks. Why? Because we're going to have to replay every event inside of your system from all time in order to give you an answer to that question. It's an absolutely terrible, terrible database. You should never use any of them. No, understand the different models. Go out and start checking out all these different databases. What are they good at? What are they bad at? Object databases are not crap. They have their uses. And there's certain types of problems that all of these systems will do extraordinarily well on, and there's certain types of problems they will all do extraordinarily poorly on. And remember the other side of this with operational complexity. You don't want to just bring in 10 databases and say, yay, we're, we're done. There are trade-offs to this as well. Now with that, I will thank you for coming out.